Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome in. And I am here today with none other than Dr. Zoe Harcomb. I'm so excited that she agreed to be here. So thank you so much, Zoe, for coming on my channel and chatting with me this morning or afternoon where you are. <laughs> it is indeed. Thank you for asking me. Absolutely. Um, would you just give us a little bit of background about yourself? Because when I told some of my my YouTube friends, <laughs> um, Zoe Harcomb's coming on my channel, some of them were like, that's amazing. She's great. And some of them were like, who's Zoe Harcomb? And I'm like, you've <laughs> got to be joking. <laughs> but for those who don't know you yet, would you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, should I, I give the short version. Um, okay. Oh, got interested in anything to do with food when my brother was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when we were both teenagers. So that kind of opened my eyes to insulin, glucose, equal and opposites. Um, went to Cambridge University. I'm very analytical, so I'm very mathematical. I look at things and wonder why things are the way they are. And I guess I then sort of observed the um, dietary guidelines starting to take hold. So you kind of remember... Um, the stuff in the fridge changed, you know, the butter mm. kind of disappeared and some weird thing in a tub came in and um, my mum was always on diets and it was sort of, oh, you know, we need low fat. And then these one calorie drinks came out that were truly disgusting and all that kind of thing. So that was kind of going on. Um, and I w got through Cambridge, um, had a sort of normal career, did management consultancy, went into um, corporate world. So I've worked in manufacturing, sales, marketing, training, um, ended up as vice president for human resources for some pretty big organizations. So I had a really interesting first career, traveled a lot, worked in, um, you know, I've been to Hong Kong and China and, and all over the place, America, worked over in America for a while. Um, then decided I was ready for a sort of career to around the time of the financial crash, actually. So around sort of 2008, 2009, and in parallel, I'd been become really interested in food and particularly obesity. And why did we have an obesity epidemic when I didn't know anyone who wanted to be overweight, let alone obese? You know, this is not um, it's not anything that people aspire to be. So why do we have this burgeoning obesity epidemic? I'd written a book 20 years ago this year, actually, which is incredible to me. 2004, my first book was called Why Do You Overeat When All You Want Is To Be Slim? And I was still an HR director at this point, and then that did okay. And I followed it up with one called Stop Counting Calories and Start Losing Weight. Um, and then I did a sort of heavyweight obesity, but within about a year of saying, right, I just want to, you know, follow my passion now and see if I can also make it my vocation, although it's obviously never going to pay as well as the first career did. <laughs> um, and we've managed to carve out our own little niche over the last 15 years. Hubby and I work together. Um, my main sort of output, I guess, at the moment is this thing called the Monday note, which a lot of doctors get, academics get. It will be the latest red meat causes cancer and there's some academic article behind it and nobody's got the time to go and dissect it. So kind of my USP is I do that so that you don't have to. Um, and that's kind of what I've been doing for the last 15 years. So I speak at conferences. I've met most of the people in this field. Um, a lot of us met at the first kind of low carb conference which was organized by Karen Thompson in Cape Town in 2015 and then we've of course had low carb Denver and there's low carb down under um, Doug Reynolds has come into this space you've got the public health collaboration in the UK so I speak at conferences quite a bit if you google me there'll be presentations online um, things that I'm known for I guess myths that I'm particularly known for busting uh, things like the calorie theory which is complete nonsense five a day which is nonsense fiber which is nonsense meat is bad for you, meat is full of saturated fat, both obviously nonsense, dietary fat guidelines are founded on evidence, that was my PhD, so I, I did a PhD 2012 to 2016, that was in the evidence base for the dietary fat guidelines, um, what else don't I like that I upset people over, um, vegans, um, I, I upset them, I used to be veggie for 20 years, so yeah. you know, like give me a break, I know where you're coming from, <laughs> um, but I've got to say it how it is now, and it's 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 not that the world should be vegan. So that, there you go. That's me. I think that's enough on me. Yeah. No, that's amazing. It's so funny because I, in preparing for this, you've like ticked off all of the my little <laughs> checklist points. So let's get into it, please. Um, so I've seen you interviewed. Well, I've seen your lectures, like you spoke of low carb fill in the blank, right? I've, I've seen those, and, and I've seen you interviewed by a couple of doctors. Um, but I'm not that, right? I, I'm a teacher. 
Um, I would like to get in, in the food guidelines for schools because boy, do I live that every day. Mm -hmm. um, but first, I just, you know, I'm not an expert in this. I'm just someone who discovered about a year ago um, a ketogenic diet, and now I'm leaning way towards more carnivore, and I just know how much better I feel. Um, and I heard people speak on it, but I feel like you're the one, like what you said, you get into the papers and you look at that. Um, I don't know how to read those things. That's not my training. I, I could teach a kid how to do long division. I can do that, <laughs> you know, but, but reading those papers and really getting into it. Um, I know that's your specialty. So I was born in 1975, which means I grew up with the food pyramid. I remember it being taught in schools. And I've heard some people say, um, plant-based people say, but we never really followed those. And all I can tell you is my experience is my mom definitely followed those. So I remember the switch from, I remember the non-fat milk coming in. I remember the boxes of cereal coming in. I remember the margarine coming in. Um, and then I remember my dad kind of slowly gaining weight throughout my whole childhood and my mom on a perpetual diet. So I, I would like you to please speak to that food pyramid. Um, was there any evidence for that? How did we get there? How did that, you know, because I can clearly remember my childhood being affected by it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, th that's really interesting because that, that ended up being the absolute heart of my PhD. So, I mean, if I can mm. remember the title, it's a bit of a mouthful. My PhD was a evaluation of the evidence base for the introduction of the dietary fat guidelines in 1977 in the US, 1983 in the UK, and it was what's known as a systematic review and meta-analysis, and it included epidemiological studies and randomized control trials. So it was a complete and utter systematic review of the evidence. It's not the whole thing about systematic review is you go in on a topic and you go into PubMed or the other academic databases, that's the most common one, and you look for everything on a topic. There's no cherry picking. There's no, oh, I like that paper because that says what I want it to say. I didn't go in with any preconceived ideas. Um, that's not research. If you go in knowing what you're going to find, that's not research. Now, you know, I look back now because I, I don't plan ahead. I mean, I'm going to have tea in an hour and a half. I don't know what I'm having for tea. I mean, that's how planned ahead I am. Um, so I didn't go into my PhD thinking, what am I going to find? That's just not the type of person I am. But if someone had tapped me on the shoulder, in the benefit of hindsight, if someone had said, what do you expect to find? You're about to spend three and a half, four years looking at this. I would have probably said, I think I'm going to find some evidence for the introduction of those guidelines, but I don't know how strong it's going to be. And it ended up that there was just no evidence whatsoever. Hmm. Um, so really quickly, it, chapter two in your PhD is what you call the review of the literature. Um, and that looks at how did we even come to think that fat was bad? Um, and you get back into Russian pathologists at the turn of the century, Ansel Keys, you get up to around the 1940s, the 1950s. Um, epidemiological studies that started being done like the Framingham study then you start getting into some of the earliest randomized control trials there were a couple in London there was one in Oslo there was one in um, Minnesota there was one in uh, Sydney and you start sort of looking at all of those that came together now the reason you're talking about the whole pyramid why am I focused on dietary fat because it was those two dietary fat guidelines that changed everything now, this is going to sound really obvious, but this was an absolute penny drop moment for me in my own exploration of nutrition, because I wasn't taught nutrition. Like you, you wouldn't have been taught nutrition in school, or if you were taught anything, it was, you know, for us, it was some plate, for you, it was that pyramid. Mm -hmm. um, so if you picture a little pie, excuse the pun in front of you, a little circle, there's only three things that we eat, and we know them as um, macronutrients, they're also known as protein, fat, and carbohydrate. Now, trust me on this one, protein just tends to be about 15 to 20% of any natural diet. And that actually holds for vegetarian diets as well as um, omnivore diets. Vegetarians might be nearer 15%. Carnivores probably get to about 20 to 25. But you might know yourself, you're not heading much north of 20 to 25 because nature doesn't provide food in the way that you can bump protein up without doing some really stupid, unnatural things. Um, okay, so you, you've got on your little circle, you've drawn a little segment that's about 15 to 20%. Now, 
Now, the dietary fat guideline that they set in 1977 in the US, that was the Senator McGovern Committee, and it was then embedded in the dietary guidelines for Americans, 1980, and of course they're reissued every five years. They've just reinforced the original nonsense that they came up with. They said, thou shall have no more than 30% of thou's calories in the form of dietary fat, overall fat, and then you should have no more than 10% of your total calories in the form of saturated fat. Now we can explore that later if you want. Let's stick with the guidelines. So on your little circle, you've got a segment that's about 15% and you've got a segment now that's 30%. You're left with one option and that's carbohydrate and that's 55%. Now, when I realized that the dietary fat guidelines set a requirement for carbohydrate by default, that was like a penny drop moment for me because in going for a low fat diet, you automatically went for a high carbohydrate diet. So everything stems from that dietary fat guideline because then the pyramids, when they realize, oh, we don't want you eating fat, it determines everything on that pyramid. Oh, people better eat starches because they've got to eat something. And it actually says in one part in the guideline, you're gonna to need to eat 55% of your diet in the form of carbohydrates. So somebody worked it out. Um, but we didn't know that carbohydrate was healthy. We didn't even know that that level of carbohydrate was safe. It was just the default from having demonized fat. And my PhD went to look at the evidence for demonizing fat. And I looked at population studies at the time and intervention trials at the time, no evidence whatsoever. And then I said, okay, that was 20 years ago, whatever. I'm now doing the PhD in 2016. There are more trials available now. Let's bring it up to date. Let's look at all of those trials. Is there any ev any more evidence today? And the answer was still no on both methods. So there is just no evidence whatsoever. Now, I mean, if you Google my name um, and put in, di I think that the, the summary paper is the best one. So Google my name, dietary guidelines have no evidence base. It will pull up a very readable summary paper um, that was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine in 2017. And what that paper does is says, don't, don't take my word for it. I've, I've spent three and a half, four years looking at this, but don't take my word for it. Let's look at the other teams that also looked at all the evidence against dietary fat. And there were seven teams and they had 40 different findings between them. And pretty much they all found absolutely nothing as well. And that's just not widely known. You know, you stop mm. 100 people in your local street and say, um, you know, is fat bad for you? And you'll probably get 100 people saying yes. Um, where does that come from? Why do you believe that? They'll have no idea whatsoever. It's just become one of those urban nutritional myths that has, has just become true over the years, but there's no evidence for it. Yeah, that kind of leads me to the next thing I wanted to talk to you about, because that was my, you know, my childhood and watching my parents and watching the refrigerator change. And then as I hit my late teens and into my 20s, um, you know, I started to put on weight myself and then, well, what did I learn? I remember my dad clearly saying, oh, it's calories in calories out. Just eat less and move more. That's what you got to do. Now, why did I believe that? Who knows? Because he, he didn't typify that. He didn't, you know, typify that by, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, his health only continued to decline throughout his life, but I thought, okay, calories in calories out and fat makes you fat, right? That was big in the nineties. Ooh. Fat makes you fat. And so I went to uh, restricting, you know, calories, but not thinking about what those macronutrients are. In fact, if I learned anything, it was that, well, carbohydrates only have four calories per gram and fat has nine. So let's steer clear of that fat because it's higher in calorie. Um, so, yeah, I went through a lot of years of a binging and then restricting cycle because I'd restrict, restrict, restrict. And my body was like, you know, help, we're starving over here. And then I would go to the binging on the chips and the cookies and the ice cream uh, and put the weight right back on, right? And then I would just kind of go through this yo-yo cycle. So, you know, not knowing any better, right? That was the best I knew at the time. But but can you speak to that a little bit? A calorie is a calorie and wow. carbohydrates only have four calories, therefore they're good. Yeah. And that is absolutely what people think. So one of the, there are so many consequences of calorie counting. Um, one of them is exactly as you've explained. It takes you one minute to realize fat's got approximately, so this is not an accurate science either, um, approximately nine calories a gram, carbohydrate approximately four, protein approximately four. So it drives you down the route of eating more carbohydrates. So you're eating rice cakes and apples. Um, the other thing that people um, do is they, they work out what gives them the biggest bang for the buck because you're hungry the whole time. 
So, and I've done a calorie control diet. Every every woman of, of our age or whatever, every woman, period, has done a calorie controlled diet at some point. So um, it drives you down the route of eating the wrong things because you realize, I, you know, I'd, I, I'd have green apples and black coffee for breakfast because, you know, that might be 100 calories or something. And then you have um, rice cakes or something for lunch. You can have four rice cake you stop thinking about what why you eat food that you actually need certain nutrients so you're not thinking about complete protein or essential fats or vitamins and minerals you only see food in the form of calories and when you start eating the same things every day and this is what my first book was about when you start eating the same things every day you are so prone to developing food intolerances and food intolerance I, I was working in the US at the time I was discovering this and they had books in the US that were 20 to 30 years ahead of the UK so I could walk into a bookshop and they had books on hyperglycemia um, candida albicans which was the early exploration of what we now talk about in terms of gut health gut flora food intolerance you know I was reading these books because I was fascinated by them and in the books there'd be passages where these doctors they were all written by doctors these books they were saying oh and I had this patient and she would go out to the 7-eleven in the middle of the night and load the grocery cart with cookies and ice cream and she was already overweight but just couldn't seem to stop eating these things and I'm like whoa 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 stop there stop there you've you you're onto something there mm -hmm. um but because this doctor was interested in food intolerance the doctor would just sort of go off and 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 do other you know go go back onto food intolerance and then I would start exploring food intolerance in more detail and then you realize food intolerance is actually at the root of food addiction because food intolerance gets you to the point that you start feeling bad if you don't have the substance that you have every day. Um, so you buy a bran muffin, on the low-fat bran muffin on the way to work because you think it's healthy and you do that for a certain period of time and then you get to the point that if you're running a bit late for work and you don't get the bran muffin, you feel bad because you didn't have the bran muffin, you're already into a, a different stage of addiction. So food addiction is number one, you want a particular thing. Stage two, you want more of a particular thing. So, you know, suddenly it's not one bran muffin. You might have a bran muffin again for, for lunch or pick one up on the way home because one just didn't seem to be quite enough. Then stage three, you get to the point that you feel bad if you don't have the bran muffin. And then people only deal with a food addiction when it gets to stage four. And stage four is you've got a consequence of your food addiction. And the most common con consequence, of course, is weight gain, um, which can, in, in more severe circumstances, lead to obesity, maybe type 2 diabetes, and so on. But food intolerance is one of the conditions that drives food cravings. Hyperglycemia is another one. We have a teaspoon of glucose in our bloodstream at any one time. That's four grams of glucose. Consume one apple, 20 grams of carbohydrate, probably approximately 10 grams of fructose, 10 grams of glucose. The fructose is going to the liver to make your liver fat, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. The glucose is going into the bloodstream, which if not addressed over time, will give you type 2 diabetes. But the body was super happy there with its four grams of glucose. You chuck in 10 grams of glucose thinking you've just some done something really healthy and snacked on an apple the body's got to get that out of the bloodstream now again over time it gets less good at getting it out perfectly so let's say it leaves you with 3.8 grams of glucose in your bloodstream at any one time you're having a little hypo at that stage you know you get a little bit shaky hands a little bit irritable a little bit cranky hangry as we call it now mm -hmm. and the body will drive you to eat so I started looking at physical reasons for overeating, not just psychological reasons for overeating. I think the physical reasons are every bit as powerful, if not more so. And the book that I wrote called Stop Counting Calories and Start Losing Weight kind of put together, you start calorie controlled dieting and it just then dominoes everything else. So first thing that happens, you get hungry. Your body does everything it can to get you to eat because it's trying to fight uh, what it perceives as a, a, um, a, an onslaught on its health, its you know, very existence. It thinks you're suddenly in a starvation situation and it's driving you to go out and get food. So that's the first thing that it does. The second thing is it just turns off loads of systems. So this whole calories in, calories out rests on the idea that the body is some cash machine for fat you know they mm. literally think it is this stupid that dietitians think um, okay I'm going to cut back by 500 calories today and the body's going to go oh there you go there's 500 calories off your waistline um, just to make up the gap it's not going to do that the last thing it's going to do is give up stuff that it thinks is going to be useful for survival going forward physiologically it can't give up 
that body fat if you've got carbohydrate present. If you've got any carbohydrate fuel present, it can't tap into that fuel. If you've got any insulin present, it can't tap into that fuel. You know, there are, there are so many reasons why this whole, oh, if you're a calorie deficit, the body will just give you the difference. It can't. In many, many circumstances, it just physically can't. Um, so the body's not going to allow you to do that. So it turns stuff off. What does it do in women? Turns off the reproductive system really quickly. Period stop grow fine hair, keep you warm, slow you down. You were going to go to the gym tonight, but you haven't got the energy. So, okay, you ate less, but forget doing more. You're not going to be able to do those two together. But then the repetitive eating of the things that you start eating every day drives what I saw as the three conditions that cause overeating, which are gut flora imbalances and the bad guys proliferating, hyperglycemia and food intolerance. So start a calorie controlled diet and, and probably many listeners have done this. You take yourself down a pathway where you will become a food addict. You will start getting fatter and sicker and wonder how that could possibly, how can, how can you do both? You know, surely if you're getting fatter, you're over consuming food. Therefore, you should be more nourished. But no, we're, we're eating the wrong thing. So we're getting too much food, but not enough nutrition. That's amazing because, yeah, you talk about um, not really caring where the calories come from. I remember in my 20s, people in college and even I was doing like we teachers in order to become teachers, we have to go first do some observations in classrooms and things. And I can remember those teachers being on a diet. I mean, how many times was I in their room? Like a few hours, 20 hours total. And they were talking about being on a diet and how they would gladly give up whatever healthy dinner they were supposed to have for some M&Ms and Diet Coke. And they thought they were going to do that tonight because just replace those calories with some M&Ms and Diet Coke. That's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. You do. I mean, I, fruit gums was my was one mm. of my go to things because uh, we, we could get a little tube of fruit gums at the time and they were about 100 calories a tube and you could just graze on those. And, you know, what I now know about what's going on in the body every time you put a gram of anything in your mouth, whether it's carbohydrate, fat or protein. I mean, it's just horrific what I must have been doing to my poor body. You know, the body's just trying to settle down. It's like, whoa, we've got to deal with something again. What is it? It's a bit of protein, right? Need to do this. Bit of carbohydrate, need to do this. Bit of fat, need to do this. You know, that oh, we've, we've just abused our body processes so much, just thinking we can just, you know, graze on little bits here and there and the body just sorts it all out and does, you know, it wants us to be eating infrequently when we've managed to catch an animal and then we can feast on it and then we might not get something for a few more hours or whatever. So, you know, maximum of three times a day is what I'm saying to people who, who we should be eating. Um, children more flexible, obviously, but, but grown ups maximum of three times a day. Well, I see uh, an interesting side conversation going on in the chat um, having to do with cholesterol. I was going to bring that in anyway. People have gotten blood work. People are talking about what their doctors are telling them about their cholesterol being high. Um, and so I can remember my dad as his cholesterol went up uh, in the 80s. I remember him getting put on a statin and I'm pretty sure he was on that for the rest of his life. He ended up with type 2 diabetes and dementia, which is what he died from. So I don't know. I mean, I know that you know some things about cholesterol and since they're talking about it in the chat and that's kind of how it affected me in my past, um, just seeing what my dad went through with that. And we've just got to lower that dang cholesterol, you know, at, at all costs. So here, take this medicine every day. What say you to that? Um, quick one. First of all, did you know that one in 50 people who take statins for five years are predicted to get type two diabetes? I didn't know the statistic like that, but I knew that it increased it and it makes so much sense to me now that it's like, oh, well, there you go with his type two diabetes and maybe even his dementia as well. Yeah. If you, oh, dementia, definitely. I mean, if you Google mm. statin diabetes lawsuit, I mean, there's one been going on in the US for, for absolutely years. Um, right, how do we tackle the cholesterol issue? Um, first of all, cholesterol is, it, oh, I mean, let's explain what it is because this is quite funny actually. If you say to a doctor, um, you know, they say, oh, we've got to lower this person's cholesterol. And, and you say, what is cholesterol? Most of them actually can't answer you. Um, mm. They just don't think at the sort of basic level of what it is. So um, it's a substance without which we would instantly die. Um, it's the structure that forms the basis of every cell in the body. So if you manage to take the cholesterol out of the body, we would literally be a puddle on the floor. No cell would have any integrity. It would have no structure. 
if you were able to hold cholesterol in your hand, it would look a little bit like you've had a vanilla candle burning in your hand and it's kind of dripped down into your hand. So it'd be kind of like a vanilla-y colour, waxy kind of substance and that's what cholesterol is. Um, it is difficult to explain how utterly life vital cholesterol is other than you know, I've just said without it you, you cease to exist. Um, in nutrition we have a term called essential and what that means is essential in the normal use of the word as in it's essential you're going to be in big trouble if you if you don't have this stuff but essential in nutrition actually means something that you must consume the body doesn't make it so we have essential proteins essential fats essential vitamins and essential minerals cholesterol is above that cholesterol is so essential that the body will not leave it to chance that you get it through food the body makes it um, now, if you consume any through food, it's it's pretty irrelevant because the body is making it and the body is making it all the time. So as a fundamental question, I would say to the people chatting in the chat room, why do you think the body is making cholesterol if it's this terrible, evil thing that is is trying to kill us at some level? And to me, that has never made sense. My PhD had to go back into cholesterol because the first thought of why did we even think that fat was bad actually started off we thought that cholesterol was bad um so you'll be able to find my phd somewhere in the british library library it's, it's on my site i can't remember if it's on open view it might be on um, paywall view for the subscribers or whatever but i went through the review of the literature to, to explain where did we even think cholesterol was bad fat was bad saturated fat was bad and all that kind of thing anyway we got it in our idea um that cholesterol is bad for us and we discovered something that could lower cholesterol in some ways by chance. There was something called red rice, something or other, um, and that developed into the early statins. And one statin alone, I think Lipitor has ended up being worth, I don't know, $250 billion or something. Um, you know, I'm sure that's, that's completely irrelevant and coincidental and has nothing to do with why cholesterol lowering has become such a huge industry. Um, but you know, some of the myths about cholesterol keep in your mind why would the body make it you know do you think the body's got a design flaw personally i don't if body seems pretty flipping fantastic to me but there you go um people will say it will clog up your arteries well you don't even have cholesterol in your arteries um i need to briefly explain that so imagine you've got a glass of water in front of you and then you've got some olive oil and you drop some olive oil in the glass of water they don't mix the olive oil just sits on top of the water now your body needs to transport fats around the body. So you eat those essential dietary fats. There are other fats being made by the body. Your body needs to transport them around the body because they've got to go to the cells to do their vital work. Now, if you imagine the fats as the olive oil in the water, think of your blood as the water and the olive oil as the fats. Clearly, you can't just put those fats into the bloodstream because it would clog things up you've got fat sat on top of water, it doesn't work. So the body has this amazing system and it's called a lipoprotein system. So lipo meaning fat, protein, the word that we, we know. Um, what this is, I think of it as, as like a little taxi, which is water friendly on the outside because it's gonna travel through, through the bloodstream and it's fat friendly on the inside because it needs to contain these fats and they need to be happy. Um, and there's five main lipoproteins um, and you'll start recognizing some of the names soon. So when we eat dietary fat, they end up going through the lymphatic system and they get packaged onto these things called chylomicrons. They're lipoproteins, they're the biggest ones. And then they go off traveling around the body, taking the important omega-3s and so on that you've eaten and taking them off to do their vital work. Um, now the liver also makes um, some lipoproteins. So the liver, for example, will make VLDL which I'm sure people have heard of. That's also very confusingly called triglycerides. Um, and the liver will make those little taxes. And all the little taxes, the VLDL, then um, break down into something called IDL, intermediate density lipoproteins. We don't hear much about that one because you can't lower it. So there's no money in telling anyone about it. Um, but you will have heard of the next one, which is the LDL which is the low density lipoprotein, which is a bit of a breakdown of the ideal. So all of this cargo system is going on around the body. And all of those lipoproteins are actually carrying the same thing. So they're carrying cholesterol and protein and phospholipids and triglycerides. And they're just carrying them in different proportions and they're different sizes. So in think of the smaller taxi, the cargo is gonna be more densely packed and in the bigger taxi, it's gonna be less densely packed. So an LDL is a low density lipoprotein. It's less densely packed, it's a taxi. 
and an HDL, which is the other one that your guys will have heard of, is a high density lipoprotein, so it's more densely packed. Both LDL and HDL are carrying those four substances that I listed, one of which is cholesterol. They are not cholesterol, they carry cholesterol. And then people start saying, oh, your LDL is bad cholesterol and your HDL is good cholesterol. Well, your LDL isn't even cholesterol, it's a taxi. It contains cholesterol, but it contains exactly the same cholesterol that's in the HDL taxi. So the whole narrative is complete and utter. Am I allowed to say bollocks? Yes. I mean, it, it, just, <laughs> it is just, it is such a fairy story. It is complete and utter nonsense when you start to unpack it. But when your doctor is sat in front of you saying, oh, you've had your blood test and I'm a little bit worried about your bad cholesterol. You know, what I would say to my doctor is, what's the chemical formula for bad cholesterol? And they won't know. So I'll say, okay, I'll tell you the formula for cholesterol. It's C27H460. So I've, I've given you a clue. What's the chemical formula for bad cholesterol? And again, they say, I don't know. And it's like, well, it's cholesterol. So it's C27H460. Now what's the chemical formula for good cholesterol? Cholesterol is cholesterol is cholesterol. It's C27H460. So what are you talking about? You're talking about taxes. Explain to your patient the lipoprotein system. They can't, they don't know it. They don't know this stuff. They just mm -hmm. get taught, like they don't get taught nutrition at medical school. So I'm going to skip ahead to now. Uh, I mean, we'll, we'll rewind, but it, only because it has to do with cholesterol. So I, I went on a ketogenic diet last February, more toward carnivore in June. I had some blood work done about three months ago. My doctor did not know anything about carnivore diets, uh, thought that ketogenic diets were horrible, not anti-inflammatory diets, diets that we should not be doing. She predicted that my cholesterol was going to go up and that she did not think it was good for me. This was all before the blood work. When I told her that I was mainly eating meat and she said, so you don't have any plants or vegetables at all. I said, no. And she said, fascinating, but it wasn't like a good kind of fascinating, <laughs> do you know? Yeah, I do so, know. I know well. <laughs> so my, so my cholesterol numbers came back and I don't, this is something I don't know if you know about or not. I mean, I know you know about it, but I don't know if you're can speak to it. So just tell me one way or the other, but, um, so, it, so I feel like I was the worst person to go into her office and be the first carnivore she's ever met because I'm a lean mass hyper responder. So we <laughs> So yeah, my triglycerides were awesome. HDL, you know, the ratio and all that was 0.85, but my LDL just said, I think it said greater than 400 or something. Like it didn't even have a number. So she's freaking out, right? And she calls me multiple times. We never did touch base, but I got a random phone call about two weeks ago, I mean, a week and a half ago, that it's time for me to go recheck my blood work. And I was like, mm, I never heard anything about doing that. I don't, I still haven't done it. I don't think I'm going to, cause I didn't go eat Oreo cookies for two weeks, like Nick Norwitz. Exactly, and I'm pretty exactly. sure it's just as high. I, I'm not sure. I just, I haven't, I've just kind of been sitting here. Like, should I add some carbs, lower it to make her feel better? Just ignore that order. But like, what say you, cause I, I know I'm a, a lean mass hyper responder and my friend Jay in the chat is one as well. And so do you know anything about that or can you speak to that? I mean, you're, you're following the right stuff already. I mean, this is the stuff that Dave Feldman has been obsessed with for about mm -hmm. eight years and good on him for being so, um, because he discovered personally as well. And it's like, hang on, what's going on here? So he's, he's been looking into this for ages. So um, I would bow to those guys and say, look, you're, you're looking at the right people. If you're looking at Dave Feldman, um, the recent Nick Norvitz study was, was really amusing. It might be one that I'll look at for a Monday note. Um, I, I've had debates with Dave and he knows um, that I'm, I'm still curious on the whole mechanism. I know from quite early on, I'd be up at Low Carb Denver or Breckenridge or something and I see Dave present and he was presenting, he, he had this little sort of ship model um, you know, I guess not dissimilar to my little taxi model, but he was trying to build a hypothesis then as to why it was happening. And it, it's essentially that in a lean person where um, you, you're going to have to get your fuel from dietary fat and from body fat. 
Um, and at different times, I mean, if you're staying the same weight, at different times of the day, you're getting them differentially from different places. So you might um, have a, a really sort of, you know, fatty piece of meat or something. And then for the few hours after that, you're almost certainly fueling on the dietary fat that you've eaten. Um, at some point, you might be dipping into body fat, usually at about four o'clock in the morning when the body will say, OK, I need to start putting something back into the bloodstream right now. And then when you eat again, you'll be back to fueling on on uh, dietary fat. So if you're staying the same weight, your fuel is coming from body fat and dietary fat, but your body fat will be being replenished at some point. Otherwise, you would be losing weight. Um, and that's that's your sort of lean mass hyper responder. Now, bear in mind that the fuel um, choice for the body will always preferentially be carbohydrate. So the body is super lazy. We don't need to eat any carbohydrate. That's the only non-essential nutrient in the whole sort of macronutrient stack. We, do, we have zero need for carbohydrate whatsoever. Um, but if we do eat carbohydrate, and most people do, and most people eat a heck of a lot, at least 50 to 60% of their diet in the form of carbohydrate, um, the body will always go and look to that store of carbohydrate first. And in the non-lean mass hyper responders, so in the people who maybe are 300 pounds and have gone on a ketogenic diet because the low calorie stuff just has not been working for them. In fact, it's the reason they've got to 300 pounds. You know, they, they go to their doctor and say, doc, I really don't eat that much. And the doctor just doesn't believe them. I believe them um, because I know that physiologically they've just got into this terrible downward spiral of getting both fatter and sicker by eating the wrong things not by eating too much but anyway they're still eating too much carbohydrate so anytime the body goes looking for fuel there is always some dietary carbohydrate that's just been eaten because they're grazing on fruit and rice cakes thinking they're doing the right thing or because they've got stored carbohydrate because if you eat more carbohydrate than the body uses up in any 24-hour period the body will store it as fat and here's, I mean, God, there's just so much to cover, isn't there? Just, just to slip in one little factoid along the way. If you think of, of, of an average female who needs about 2,000 calories a day, think of calories as petrol. They're no use in any other way of thinking. But in that, if you then know how much is needed for the basal metabolic rate versus how much is needed for energy on top, about 1,500 of those calories are basal metabolic rate. So if you were sick in bed all day, you'd still need about 1,500 calories to keep your basal metabolic needs go in, fighting infection, building bone density, repairing your muscles and all the rest of it. Now the body wants that delivered by fat and protein. Carbohydrate is really not going to be of any benefit if you're trying to build muscles and build bone density, it just isn't. So you probably only have 500 calories on top, which is what a moderately active female would use on a typical daily basis. So go back to that pie, the penny drop moment where you've got 55% of your diet in the form of carbohydrate. On a 2000 calorie diet, that's 1100 calories, but you only needed 500 calories for energy. Now the body can use carbohydrate for energy. It can also use fat. It didn't need the carbohydrate, but you ate 1100 calories of carbohydrate. So you've got the 500 that you need for energy, but you've got 600 that you didn't need and that you can't use for building bone density and fighting infection. So what does the body do? Store them as fat. So you can go on that 1500 calorie a day diet and still get fat because you're eating the wrong things. Yeah, that's the sentence I wish I would have heard of when I was 16, 17, 18 years <laughs> old, funny. right? It's like, oh my gosh, here I go. Just because yeah. I would restrict, restrict, restrict. And yeah. I mean, I never got very overweight, but I was lethargic, unhealthy, no energy because my calories were just so low, yeah. you know, until I just couldn't do it anymore, you know, yeah. but. So, um, so the overweight person has got the carbs to fuel on. So in the theory that Dave Feldman has developed, they don't tap into a sort of fat fueling system very, you know, only when they go keto kind of thing. The body's actually releasing body fat. It's going looking for that because it can do that. It's not going to get to the point where it's going to fuel on dietary fat because it's still got some other things that it can work on. But the lean people are in this different kind of scenario where the body's going to use dietary fat and then body fat, then replenish body fat, dietary fat. I... I need to look into it more and I need another debate with Dave because we haven't had, we had a debate. He was over here just before COVID broke in February 20. He was actually staying with us. Um, oh. and we had some really good chats then and, you know, I was kicking back and like, you know, mm, not sure. 
Um, but you know, the, the stuff that Nick did recently with the Oreo cookie, if you need to go and have a blood test because your work demands it or your insurance policy demands it, I mean, God, how ridiculous is that? You're gonna have to eat Oreo cookies for a couple of days just to knock yourself out of ketosis and knock yourself out of the, um, the high LDL situation just to keep your doc happy and then get over the cravings and get back on what you were doing. Thank you very much. I mean, mm -hmm. do I think it is harmful in any way for a lean mass hyper responder? No, because I have no fear of cholesterol whatsoever. I don't think the body is making cholesterol because it's trying to kill you. You know, if it's got high LDL, it's got high LDL for a reason. It's not because it's trying to kill you. And everything else improves, right? You you know, your mm -hmm. HbM1c improves, your triglycerides yeah. improve. I mean, I, you know, I don't care about HDL. Triglycerides are actually quite important because that's a marker of your carbohydrate consumption. Blood okay. glucose levels is probably the single most important measure you can get done on a blood test. Your weight improves, your mental energy improves, your you mm -hmm. know, physical exercise and activity, your sleep improves. Mm -hmm. Everything improves. And then the doctor's like, oh, your LDL cholesterol has gone really high. I'm like, yeah. I'm smiling because that's exactly what happened to me. The more carnivore I got, the more all those things you just said improves, improves, improves. That's what happened to me. So the more I got rid of the plant matter that I was still eating, uh, yeah, the better all that stuff got for me. Um, and but yeah, I mean, she she told me that a ketogenic diet is not anti-inflammatory, and that's when I was pretty sure she did not know much about it at all. <laughs> the most inflammatory food that I can think of is wheat. Um, you know, if you want to read Dr. William Davis, Wheat Belly, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant book. I, I, again, I think this, if you go on my site, zoeharkham.com, put in why is wheat so bad? I mean, that might well be on open view as well, actually, because it's, it was a dissection of that book. Um, mm. great book. And the number of people I know who just give up wheat, you know, virtually nothing else. And it, it's health transformative. It really mm. is just overnight. Well, that being said, I think some of those uh, guidelines and doctors and things tell us to eat, you know, whole wheat so we can get fiber. So the, here's my experience with that. I never was trying to get, I never thought about fiber for myself, but when I had my second son, um, he had texture issues. He has sensory issues and he had a hard time transitioning to solid foods. So even though he was over one year old, but he was eating like still pureed foods, but it was like fruit and veggies and oatmeal and things. And this child was so constipated for a year and a half, two years where, and I didn't know anything about, I mean, my doctor just put him on medicine. That's what happened. So, um, I would have to help him. I would have to hold his knees to his tummy, rub his belly. I mean, it was bad probably like once a week. Cause that's all, you know, that's all he would ever go even eating all those foods. Like he wasn't eating meat and things. Um, I mean, he's 15 now and he's, he's gone ketogenic in the last three weeks because he has ADHD and, um, I'm very excited to see how it's helping him with that. Um, but that's my experience. And looking back with the knowledge that I have now, I'm like dummy, <laughs> but I just d went with the doctor's recommendation and we went through a year and a half, two years of, of that. So, um, what say you to fiber and do we need it? And, uh, does it help us stay regular? Like they tell us. Yeah. I'm really sorry to hear that actually, because that's so uncomfortable for a little one, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, I'm just, I was thinking of you when you were saying that story and, it's like your sink is blocked up with, you know, you've put lard down the sink or something and it's clogged the sink up. And then the plumber comes around and says, oh, you know, just put more lard in. That will that will help the lard that's stuck, you know, go through. I mean, how, how did that ever make sense? OK, do we need fiber? 100% no. I mean, there is no debate about that. That's that's not a controversial statement at all. It's a fact. Um, it comes from the fact that there is no essential carbohydrate. And that's admitted if you go to the... Um, famous document panel on macronutrients 2005 I think it's page 287 or something um, it states there is no requirement for carbohydrate provided that enough fat and protein are eaten there it seems to be no requirement for carbohydrate well, there is no requirement for carbohydrate whatsoever so you start from the fact that there is no requirement for carbohydrate fiber is a subset of carbohydrate so de facto here's the mathematician talking there is no requirement <laughs> for fiber you don't need A, and B is a subset of A, you don't need B. Um, so 
carbohydrates, you've got monosaccharides, what we know as glucose, fructose and galactose. You've got disaccharides, things that we know as um, sucrose, um, yeah, sucrose, which will be a molecule of glucose and a molecule of fructose. Um, then you move up into the polysaccharides, many sugars. And the technical term for fibre within what is a carbohydrate is that fibre is indigestible polysaccharides. So poly many saccharide sugar, it's a many sugar structure that we cannot digest. So tell me when you know that, how this can be something that's good for us. Because you know, having answered the question, do we need fibre? No, not controversial, 100% no. The next question that you should ask is, okay, we don't need it, but is it good for us? Um, and my answer to that would also be no. Um, how can many sugar, indigestible, whatever's be good for us? Um, I actually think, now that they've realised that they've developed these guidelines that are very heavily based on low-fat, high-carbohydrate, and they won't move away from them. It's, I think they fear legislation, partic particularly in the US. I think they fear litigation too strongly. If people to come out to say, so hang on a sec, you've just changed those low fat, high carb guidelines. What are you, are you admitting that you gave me obesity and type two diabetes and heart disease and probably cancer because of those guidelines that nobody can afford to make that change. So they just keep doubling down and say, you need to go low fat, high carb, but they've admitted that you don't actually need carbohydrates. So it's almost like the last excuse they've got for getting you to eat carbohydrate is, oh, but you must eat 30 grams of fiber a day, because of course fiber is a subset of carbohydrates. So if you're gonna eat fiber, you've got to eat carbohydrate. It's, it's like it's the, I can't think of any other reason for trying to hang on to this nonsense that we somehow need fiber. It can only be because they're trying to continue to justify telling us to eat carbohydrate. Um, and then, of course, within the fibre thing, the strongest argument that people come up with is, oh, it feeds your microflora. You know, if you don't I've have fibre, you know, you're not going to have good gut flora kind of thing. It's like, so hang on a sec. So this thing that we can't digest, that we have zero requirement for, is somehow supposed to be really good for our gut flora. You know, I see fibre as incredibly abrasive. You know, is fibre not the reason that we have a massive increase in indigestion, irritable bowel syndrome, diverticulitis, Crohn's disease, celiac disease. Um, you don't see that in people who aren't eating fiber. So I'm really not convinced by that. But the whole, I do this in my fiber presentation. If you Google my name and fiber presentation, there's a low carb one. Mm -hmm. um, the one in Denver, I think was about half an hour. And I go through what actually is good for gut, gut flora. And okay, some of it is in the past. And if you didn't get it right, there's nothing that can be done about it. So you needed healthy parents. That's your best way to start with good gut flora. You need to be born naturally, not through cesarean, because then you get flushed with your mum's um, bacteria, good bacteria and so on. Um, if that didn't happen, you didn't get off to a great start. There's nothing you can do about it. You need to be breastfed for as long as mum can manage to do that. So, you know, there's all of those things that get you off to a great start. Don't take antibiotics in childhood unless, you're, unless your life depends on it. Ditto in adulthood because antibiotics are just going to wipe out your natural gut flora. If you do have to take antibiotics because you're going to die if you don't, then take probiotics alongside. Um, and then, of course, you've got loads of natural foods that are very much fat proteins rather than carbohydrates that are just fantastic for gut flora like natural live yogurt bio yogurt with lactobacillus and acidophilus and all that kind of thing blue cheese um you know if you ferment food or um pickle food in any way you know you might end up with something that's not you know pickled herrings there's got no carbohydrate in it but it is going to do some good things for your gut flora so you know the idea that we've got to have beans on whole wheat toast to somehow make our gut flora better i mean it's just like that is so far down the pecking order of what is going to make your gut flora better um if your gut flora isn't great or you worry about it in any way have kefir you know go and take a course of kefir it's in every grocery store now you don't even have to get it from a specialist site you will actually get a bit of a colonic effect you know that that's what your little toddler should have had I'd have had him on kefir, you know, yeah. you'd have had the nuclear of all nappies mm -hmm. in the first couple of days, just flush it through, repopulate that gut flora, happy days. The second thing I would have tried with your little one is vitamin C mm. because the body um, 
the, the water soluble vitamins, the B vitamins, the eight B vitamins and the single vitamin C, those are the water soluble vitamins. So B vitamins come out in your urine, which you'll know if you take a B vitamin tablet, your pee will go yellow, bright yellow. That's mm -hmm. just you peeing some vitamins down the toilet. You took too, too many. You should have saved your money. Vitamin C is it's excreted. So when you get to the point that the body's got enough vitamin C, the body will just pass it through. But if you get the dose right, you get very natural, comfortable bowel movement. Um, mm. You know, we've got apple trees a lot where we live in Wales. Now, in medieval times, you know, it was, it was legendary that the kids would go out scrumping when the apples were ready. They'd eat as many as they could because they taste great. And then they spend the next 24 hours on the toilet. So, you know, they, <laughs> they soon learn not to do that again because they had so much vitamin C. Um, that everything, you know, sort of passed through them. It's just the body's way of getting rid of excess that it doesn't need. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I wish I, you know, I wish I wouldn't, I wish I would have known a lot of things, you know, 20 years ago, but uh, I know them now. Um, I know you're not a medical doctor, but I know you can speak to the difference between meat protein and plant protein. So West Coast Lass is saying that she has fibroids. Everything I read says to avoid red meat and fatty meats, milk, caffeine. My naturopath wants me to eat plant protein. Health is this true? So can you just speak to the differences between plant protein and then protein that we get from meat? Yes. Yeah, so back to um, what is essential in nutrition, something that we must consume. The body doesn't make it. So we've got essential fats. That's omega-3 and omega-6. We've got essential proteins. There's a bit of a debate. Are there eight essential amino acids amino acids being the structure that protein breaks down into are there eight or are there nine don't worry too much um you know whether it's eight or nine we have a certain number of essential amino acids that we must consume in our diet the body doesn't make them and one of the other interesting things i mean i was vegetarian for 20 years before working out nutrition for myself um one of the interesting things about essential nutrients is they are provided in animal foods rather than plant foods. And if they come in two forms, so for example, vitamin A comes in the form of retinol and it comes in the form of carotene. Retinol is found in animal foods, carotene is found in plant foods. Every single time you find something that the body needs, it's the animal food version that it wants. Um, so the essential amino acids are found in animal foods and they're found in the right ratios in animal foods. So people who are proponents of plant foods will say, oh, you can get all the essential amino acids. You just need to sort of mix your plant proteins carefully. You know, again, go on my site. I'm trying to think what will probably plant protein will call up this particular article or put in chickpeas versus eggs that might call it up as well and there was a claim in medical um medscape one day where they said oh you know you just get all the protein you need from chickpeas and it's like that's just not true so i actually went into it in the kind of forensic way that i do for every monday note and i said okay let's look at 100 grams of chickpeas let's look at 100 grams of eggs what are the ascent what's the profile of the essential amino acids that you get in eggs what is it in chickpeas it's like you're getting them but you're not getting them in the right amounts and you're not getting them in the right ratios so if you want that one from chickpeas and i can't remember you know it's lysine or something something that's low if you want that yeah you could eat more chickpeas and get more of that particular one but then you're out of balance with all the others because you're then getting too much of those or you're getting the wrong ratio of those relative to the plant things that you're eating so the body wants you to eat animal foods it's what we've evolved to eat um i question the naturopath quite honestly you know i think in many ways um, I'm, you know, I'm very open to holistic medicine and, and people who particularly haven't necessarily been through the system um open to anyone who's looking at health in different ways and different people can make great points and then not such great points um plant protein just isn't going to help with anything it just isn't relative to animal protein you need so much less as well of animal protein you know when you look at that 100 grams of the egg it's like great tick you know you've got everything you need okay how much chickpea would i need to consume to start getting that particular amino acid um, and then what do i need to combine it with so i don't have too much of that and not enough of that it just gets complex We've evolved to eat animals. You know, it's not what I wanted to find out when I was a vegetarian. Um, go back and look at cave drawings from a thousand years ago. There's no one sat there chopping up vegetables. You know, a cave drawing is like a man with a spear, and it is a man, sorry it is, you know, a man with a spear running after an animal. And the man looks like a stick insect. That's a cave drawing, that's how we lived. 
when when we were evolving from sort of Neanderthals into rocket scientists. Yeah. Thank you, Carnival. Thank you for getting my Monday notes. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I need to start doing that. <laughs> I didn't know I didn't know that was a thing you could do. <laughs> I'm gonna need to do that. Um so I guess that kind of bring it's kind of a good segue into my last thing since I brought the lean mass hyperresponder thing up earlier. So as my channel's gotten bigger, I've started to catch the attention of some vegans and things like that. And um, I get comments um, like, we are not designed to eat meat. How stupid do you have to be to think that? And um, I was listening to a kind of a debate um, and that, that it was like between two doctors, like a vegan and a carnivore. And the vegan doctor was saying, well, we're clearly designed to eat uh, like starches and carbs and things because we have amylase in our saliva. Like that's what he said. So he didn't say the sharp pointy teeth thing. Like we don't have, but he said amylase in our saliva. That means that our body is made to kind of digest, you know, the starches and carbohydrates. Um, so I'm just wondering what you have to say on that, the vegan argument, and can you sort of go through that for us and why maybe you disagree with that? Yeah, I mean, that, that one's just really easy. I think we're omnivores. Um, I think, you know, I've, I met Georgia Eads, Georgia stayed with us. Um, there are people who feel better when they don't have plants. And I, I, some people feel better not having some plants, some pe people feel better not having all plants. Um, but we are omnivores. Um, so that means we can digest carbohydrate, we can digest protein, and we can digest fat. So absolutely unquestionably, we have salivary enzymes that will break down. So, you know, let's say you eat um, uh, a nut. Nut is a really good example. A nut has got protein, carbohydrate, and fat in good measure. So you start eating a nut, the carbohydrate in the nut starts getting digested in the mouth. So the salivary enzymes kick in and start digesting the carbohydrate bit. The nut travels a little bit further down the digestive tract. The stomach is where we digest protein. So the stomach will start taking the protein out of the nut and breaking it down into the individual amino acids to do what is needed to be done throughout the body. Um, that's why the stomach is so acidic, so it can break down those structures. And then any fat in the nut will carry on going down the digestive system, and that's dealt with sort of further down the, the lower intestine. That's, as I say, when it ends up getting packaged out on chylomicros and, and so on. So, yeah, our digestive system can handle all three macronutrients. So I think where people are okay eating all three macronutrients, they should eat all three macronutrients. I mean, personally, I don't want to be a carnivore. I would... Um, I would find it miserable. I like plants very much. Um, I live near, you know, my garden has berries and apples and figs and pears and um, potatoes and beetroot and carrot and lettuce and all sorts of, you know, why would I not eat that? Um, that's my local indigenous food um, and has been for, for many long times. But there's also lambs and cows in the field and there's fish. If I look out of the window, I can see the sea. Um, so that's my local food. Why would I not eat anything that's local to me if it's not particularly causing me a problem? Um, but it cannot be denied that the nutrients that the body needs are found in the form that the body needs them in animal foods. Um, so the, the doctor that actually wants you to be vegan, so entirely plant-based, um, we have this movement in the UK called Veganuary, um, which is trying to get people to go vegan in January. And I've done an article on that on my website. And I caught the lead, um, the, the sort of founder of this Veganuary movement on the um, main BBC um, television network one, one January. And she was sat there saying, you'll need to supplement. There are things mm. that you don't get from a vegan diet. So I'm like, great, okay, at least you're being honest. Um, what don't you get from a vegan diet? You don't get retinol, which is the form that the body wants vitamin A. Um, don't assume that you can convert from carotene. I found out the hard way um, when I ended up in Moorfields Eye Hospital having two operations that I didn't need that I mm. don't convert very well from carotene to retinol. So, sorry guys, I can't be a vegan. I have to eat animal foods, otherwise I'm going to go blind. You don't get B12 in plant foods. Um, you, know, you don't get D3 in plant foods. You can get D3 from the sun, but not for six months of the year and not for about 15 months of the year where I live in Wales. So that just doesn't work. <laughs> um, you know, what else can't you get? You can't get omega-3 in the form that the body needs it, EPA and DHA. You can't get um, your complete proteins. You can't get the most absorbable form of iron or zinc or whatever. 
um, the body wants us to eat animals. I'm just really sorry that it does. I mean, in terms of the, the complete argument, again, Google my name, Google, should we be vegan? A presentation will come up. The three arguments for being vegan stroke vegetarian, and I know them because I was, Number one, it's healthier. It, it's just not. You just like don't even you know forget that argument. You just can't even win that one. Um, you just can't get what you need from a vegan diet. Number two, it's better for the animals, um, and that's denial, quite frankly. Because and the point I make in this presentation is there's a great article called Field Deaths in Plant Agriculture, and you look at sort of you know the modern day combine harvesters that sweep across the field, and they're about the width of a tennis court. Um, hoovering up rabbits, voles, mice, birds, worms, snails, flies, bumblebees, you know, whatever. Domestic cats, sorry, but, you know, if your mm. cat just happened to be in the local cornfield when it's about to be um, turned into corn, then, you know, you've got animals in your cereal. How they get them out, I don't know. Um, but there's nothing that you can eat for which something hasn't died not in terms of agriculture or modern farming. You might be able to grow a lettuce down the garden and keep the snails away from it, but that's not going to sustain you. And then the final argument is that it's better for the planet. Well, it's the, it will destroy the planet. You know, if we went vegan overnight and we had no ruminants because we don't need them anymore because nobody is, is eating them. Farmers don't keep pets, they just disappear. So, you know, that's it. You don't have goats, um, cows, sheep pigs oh, pigs aren't ruminants but you know they, they'd be gone as well um domestic cats would be gone because they're carnivores so they die out they are obligate carnivores so you don't have your domestic cat anymore dogs wouldn't fare too well either they're not going to fare very well on a plant-based diet so you know you dear vegans you will lose a lot of animals if you want to go to a we don't eat animals kind of world but more seriously for the planet because ruminants are the animals that protect the topsoil you destroy the entire topsoil on the planet. Then you can't grow your plant food in soil because you destroyed the soil because you didn't let ruminants rejuvenate it. Now, you've got companies like Cargill and Monsanto that have already worked that out. If we can persuade everyone to go plant-based, we destroy the world's ability to produce food. But we're already producing food upside down in greenhouses with no soil needed. Great. So then Cargill and Monsanto control the food supply and you get what they decide should be produced upside down in greenhouses, which means you then don't get the nutrients. The minerals are, are the main ones that we get from the soil. Um, so we don't then get the iron, the magnesium, the zinc, copper, manganese, and all those great things. So we continue to get fat and we get even more sick. So we are getting so out of touch with what we should be eating and what nature is all about and how we can live in a symbiotic way with nature for the benefit of the animal and for the benefit of us and for the benefit of the soil and the planet. Yeah, that's well said. <laughs> well, I think with that, I've kept you for an hour and I know you said you're at a conference or something else this week, right? You're, you're do, busy yeah, lady. I've got, I've got a two, two day conference. They're asking for the, um, for the presentation by end of day. And given that I am this last minute.com person, they're going to get it. Time? Yeah, that, no, we got 55 minutes. They'll get yeah. it. Don't worry. They'll get it. They'll get it in 55 minutes. All oh, good. Well, <laughs> Uh, thank you to everyone who tuned in or if you're watching this on the replay. Thank you, uh, Miss Zoe, for coming on and chatting with me today. I appreciate all your knowledge and insights and kind of walking through my life with me um, to kind of dispel those myths that have, you know, from from age zero to age, you know, 47 when I finally learn better. So thank you. There you go. At least you got there. Some people get all the way to the end and they don't work it out. So that's right. Like my dad. Too late. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry yeah. To hear that. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, uh, have a great day, everybody. Have a great afternoon over there in Wales. And I guess we'll uh, see you guys around the internet. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.